bad call at all. Right. All right. We can at least try it. No, no, we may. Hopefully, hopefully we don't need it, but we may try it. All right. All right. Pulling up the notes. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance, Weekly Scrap, number 143, with special guest Dave LeBlanc. I am uh, super excited about this because this is one of my favorite people just to have conversations with. Uh, Three decades of being involved in the fire service, author. He ran one of my favorite blogs. Uh, When I promoted the company, officer had a huge impact on me. Uh, His articles on Backstep Firefighter blog, uh, views from the front seat. Uh, like I said, when I when I was a young officer, this man shaped me whether he knew it or not. Uh, he is currently the chief of his department, which puts him in a uh, very special company because, generally speaking, there's not a lot of chiefs that make it on the scrap. Out of 145 episodes, I think he's the fifth uh, chief chief to make it on here. So that's pretty special company. Uh, like I said, I love this guy. Amazing conversations each and every time. So with all that being said, Chief Dave LeBlanc. Welcome, my brother, to Weekly Scrap number one forty-three. Thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the invite. I, I'm humbled by your words. Um, it's uh, it's it's always good to hear they had an impact. Um, I'm not sure that I'm do I'm worthy of that, but uh, you know I appreciate it anyways. And uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's great to be on the show. You you know what you do here is phenomenal, and uh, you know have an opportunity to share whatever I have to share. And I, you know, I really appreciate it. Beautiful, man. Is there anything I left out of the intro that you would like to add? Well, I, the, so the only thing I'd like to add, and I get a little shout out. So Bill Carey, it's his birthday today. Um, nice. So it's kind of even more appropriate. And you know, my, my voice where I got the opportunity to start writing and everything started with Bill and backstop firefighter. So I don't know that I would be where I am. The opportunities I've had to teach, teaching at FDIC, um, all the conferences I've taught at all came out of my writing and, and, uh, and I owed all that to him. So happy birthday, Bill. And you never know where those, uh, impacts are going to come from, man. Right. That's yeah. hundred percent. His impact on you, your impact on me, and, and now the impact this scrap's going to have moving forward. All right. I'm going to tell everybody as we go forward, there are internet issues so far. I know it's locking up every once in a while. I don't know how the impact is. So you have to let me know as the, as the crowd out there, as the guests, as long as it's uh, good enough to listen to is what I'm trying to say. We will press forward, but if it becomes unintelligible or we start sounding like robots, you have to let me know because me and me and Dave sound great together here. So uh, with that, with that caveat, keep me informed. I'm counting on the audience as always. If you have questions for Dave or myself or any of the topics or any of the rabbit holes we go down, Throw them up here because, as always, Kyle Romagus, Mr. Smoothbore Cartel, Mr. Sexy Mustache, although I got to say Dave's giving him a run for his money. Uh, I, got nothing, there. I got nothing on that man. I got nothing on that man. <laughs> he is curating the questions and will throw them at us. So with all that being said, Dave, let me catch you up with what a few people have said. Stash-tastic. That came from Joey Hayes. Knocking out Dave from Greg Wheeler. Chief Dave LeBlanc is one of the best out there from Brandon Pfaff. Hi from Houston. Let's go. That's from Roy Digray. Jaime Reyes, one of my other favorite people, said, here we go. All right, man, 100%. There is a ton of it. All right, with all that being said, we're going to jump right off into topics. Is there any other housekeeping I needed to do? Okay, here we go. Leadership challenges as you promote. That's what I kind of wanted to start with because the last time I talked to you, you were not in your current position. And uh, you definitely have a perspective over time of changing seats and, and the perspectives and the responsibilities and the uh, the view that comes with that. So that's where I wanted to kind of kick it off with. So, you know, I, I'm blessed that, you know, I, I grew up in, uh, and promoted within the same organization. So while that brings challenges and we're, and we're small shop, um, you know, 36 full time, including the deputy, myself and, uh, and all the shift personnel. So, you know, that's good and bad, right? You know, everybody, you know, the ins and outs of the place. And the nice thing, the transition from when I was deputy chief was my boss and I worked really well together. So I didn't have to, you know, it was only, I didn't feel like I came in and had to make a lot of changes. Certainly there's things you always want to do. I'd say probably the most humbling thing about the whole thing and, we're blessed. We've got a great department, great group of people. Um, love going to work every day with them. They do an awesome job for the town. But 
you know, there's, there's so much you want to do. And I think we all had those days sitting in the recliner said, you know, ah, someday when I'm chief, I'm gonna, yeah, those words are a lot easier to say than they are to do. And I think you realize that at every level, you realize a lot, like when you're shift officer, when you're company officer, when you're deputy, you, know, you want to change it, but you can do it. You know, you can certainly pull the old, you know, I'm dad and I said so thing. And, but that doesn't work. You know, you need buy-in from the group and uh, it's not always easy. And there's times you got to put your big boy pants on and say, Hey, well, this is what we're doing because of what we have to do, but you're much better if you can build a consensus and try and make those changes. And that's not always easy to do. So I will retire. I know I'll retire whenever I do being frustrated at the, at the laundry list of things that I wanted to accomplish that I wasn't able to. It doesn't mean the organization is going to be less than what it is. It just means that they're, there are things that I wanted to do that, you know, for whatever reason, either people didn't see the value in them that I did, or I wasn't able to get the consensus or, you know, in some cases there are ideas I've moved away from based on um, what I thought was a good idea. But when you start getting other input, you kind of go, ah, maybe it's not so much. Maybe we'll, you know, maybe we'll right. go a different direction. So maybe this wasn't worth the energy. I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And you know that, so you got to keep your ego away from your ideas because that, that that's a, a killer, you know, and, and I, I mentioned this to you last night and I, you know, I'll, I'll touch on it. Cause this definitely is the biggest thing I learned is like, you have to be okay with other people not knowing your side of the story. And that, that is impossible for me. So I, I struggle with that every single day because <laughs> I, I feel be like I always have to everyone, tell my side yeah. of the story. I have to explain myself. I have to, I have to let people know, you know, why, but it's okay because you're not going to convince everybody. Buddy. And even when you explain it, people aren't going to either agree or see it with your perspective or understand it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating. I love it. I love going to work every day, but there's days I come home and I'm, you know, I'm mentally exhausted versus being physically exhausted. So. Has there been a, uh, uh, I know it's challenging. Like you said, uh, you have to be okay with people not knowing your side of the story. And, and you said that's tough for you. Dude, that's that's damn near impossible for, I think, most firefighters. Uh, we want to be understood, especially when we're making decisions. Right. Um, has there been anything specific that's really just uh, been a tough, jagged pill? Uh, and without getting into the details of your organization, but just in general. No, you know, I, you know, knock on wood things, have, you know, a couple minor issues and everything else. And, you know, I think like anything, there's um, – you know, you always know when you make a decision, when it involves, you know, personnel or something like that, that the person that are being affected are going to have their perspective. And that's the one that's going to be heard the most because not everybody sitting in the chief's office asking him, Hey, how come this happened? And when they are, you're not telling them because it's most of the time it's not their business. And it's a personnel issue. Yeah. But the personnel will always have the last word, you know, that they'll be the one sitting around the kitchen table telling the story. And that's kind of, you know, where I learned about it. Like, I got to be okay with that. You have to be okay with that because you're not going to, you're never going to impact or influence that. And eventually one of two things happens, either the truth comes out or the, the rest of the story comes out, but not because of you, because somebody else or it, the noise dies, you know, and it is what it is. And people realize that, you know, they may be upset about something or they didn't think it went, went the right way. And, and then they find something else out later on or they move on and it's a different issue. So, um, you know, I can't put my finger on one specific issue. It's sure. even when I was deputy, it's every single case of discipline that I was ever involved with um, is always that way. You always know that there's the, you know, there's the, the troop level story, which is both sides of it. You know, it's, it, but you know, tend to, the victim tends to be the one that everybody gravitates towards. So, and it's, no. and I shouldn't say the victim because it's not, you know, discipline to me, uh, it's never personal. And it's, it's always about just trying to keep everybody, you know, inside the lines. That's all it is. And, um, you know, it's always we've done in my mind with, with a helping hand and trying to make the person better and, and correct an action. So, um, but it's not always seen that way right? right so that's that's kind of one of those stories and they definitely deal with it at the top with like trying to you know town policy you know pushing town policy down it's 
hundred percent dealt with it with COVID. And, and I will tell you that, um, that was the, so I became chief in the middle of COVID. Okay. So I dealt with it. I dealt with it for almost year, six, eight months as, as deputy, and then became chief in the middle of it. And, um, you know, fighting the, the belief, the disbelief, the, you know, the, the, the backyard scientists, the, you know, and we fought all that, you know, that all the time. And really what became my mantra through that whole thing, it's just like, you know, we don't have a choice, right? This, these are the guidelines. We're going to follow the guidelines period end of story. And it, it, you know, to me, wasn't a choice until somebody smarter than me tells me to do something different. There's no choice involved here. And that it's kind of what we did. Um, and we always tried to, you know, put some common sense into the whatever the decision making was, whatever the policy was, whatever the the thing was. Because I I always tried to keep, you know, I was sympathetic to to the guys who were going out the door every single day, the people going out the door every single day, getting stuck in a twenty foot, twenty square foot ambulance, you know, when especially in the beginning, when we thought it was, you know, really, 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 really scary. Um, that created a lot of stress and that was where we always tried to kind of attenuate that stress and, and keep people happy. We've got questions coming at you from the audience already. Oh boy. Yeah. Always. But that, it, it, this is solid, man. Marco, Soam, right. Marco Isom said, Dave, did you do anything special to get buy-in from the crew? What did you do when you got pushback? So I think it, um, nothing special i think it, it's so um there's a i'm trying to remember the book and i'm not going to remember where it came from but it, it kind of was an eye-opener for me of you know people need to know the why and everything starts with the why it doesn't matter how well you explain something whatever if you can explain the why to somebody and make them understand the why then everything else kind of layers off top of that. So it's, it, I try to do that. And, um, and that, and that was both ways when you're trying to explain something and when you're trying to determine something out. So I had a, a great instructor in one of my chief classes, um, after when I made deputy that, um, he used to, you know, he, he, it was this old proverb that he quoted and it basically would seek first to understand. And I, and I loved it because I, yes. it's right. So, I ask a lot of questions and, and I always try to explain to people like me asking questions, isn't me questioning what you're doing. It's me trying to understand why you did it. And that those are two completely different things, right? right? Questioning somebody is saying, why did you do that? Whereas trying to understand is, Hey, I'm trying, you know, and it, it's, and it's how you word it obviously in, in, in the tone and everything else in which it comes with. But yeah, that, that seek first to understand and, and, and knowing the why and trying to, to share the why because it makes everything else understand people understand why they may still not may not agree with it, but at least they know it's not just something that you're trying to do just to do it. Love the answer. And that's, that, that, it's a, uh, definitely a life hack for buy-in if there is one, uh, mm-hmm. smoothbore cartel said the easy solution, the basis behind expect fire, ROE versus OSHA and make a hole, make it wide are some of my favorite articles. Chief LeBlanc is a true inspiration. So there you go. I wanted to give you a hype one because that is a, yeah, a good nice. list of articles right there. Uh, going to the next question, uh, which Kyle says is not a question, but Jack McGovern uh, states best bit of advice I ever got from Chief LeBlanc was to go for a ride. Please get him to talk about the importance of going for a ride. So I stole this from, so I had a cool, uh, it's a little story behind the story. So one of my mentors is a retired deputy chief from Mansfield, Mass. I went to college with him, great friend of mine. Um, and one of his mentors was the, his chief when he was a, a young firefighter who went on to become the deputy state fire marshal. And then I got, when I was teaching at the local fire academy, I got to work with his boss, you know, his mentor. So the mentor of my mentor, as I used to say all the time. Right on. And I was having a bad day one day. I was at work. Um, probably something to do with a disagreement between me and the, and the and my boss, because we didn't always see eye to eye. He was a great boss, but, you know, that's just life. You know, you don't always see super frustrated. And 
Um, so I went out, I got on the phone, I'm talking to him. And, and so Jim told me, he's like, get in the car and go for a ride. And I was like, okay. And he's like, go for a ride and go for a little while and just cool down. Just drive around, look at the town, do whatever you're doing. And when you get done with your ride, if you're still pissed off, go home, take the rest of the day off. Cause you're not going to do anything effective. So then the best part was hearing the same, the same words come out of his mentor's mouth. A little while later, we were having that conversation and he's like, yeah, that's hundred percent. Get in the car, go for a ride. It's uh, I do it all the time. Sometimes I do it even when I'm not having a bad day. I love just driving around and going down streets that you don't normally go down and looking at houses and everything else. But um, I think a little bit better when I'm driving around and it certainly gives you the opportunity. The biggest thing that I learned getting promoted was uh, I almost let, I very rarely engage anything in the moment. I'm a, so I'm a, I'm a emotional person, emotionally driven, huge, emotionally driven person, which is a detriment. Um, I get pissed off really easy. I don't, I don't get outwardly pissed off, but I get pissed off inside and I will make bad decisions and I will react poorly in those moments. So I walk away a lot, cool off, think about it, talk to somebody and then come back to it and then see if I still feel the same way before, um, before I, you know, I jump into something. Sometimes you have to react in the moment. I really try not to. Out of curiosity, just for myself, how, uh, how is it, you know, 30 year in the service, Dave LeBlanc, rewind time and say, how, how, how much different was that for young Dave LeBlanc? So young Dave LeBlanc didn't get pissed off because I didn't have anywhere near the amount of influence or, or responsibility that I have now. So I was just dumb and rode in the back of the ambulance and rode in the back of the fire truck. And, okay. um, but you know, a life lesson way back then is I used to get, I used to get cranked up with the guys who worked on my shift that were maybe weren't as doing something or whatever. And my captain said to me one day, who ultimately ended up being my chief when I was deputy, and he said, "You know, the problem is you're holding them to your standard, and when you're a peer, that's hard to do. You know, there's a certain amount of peer pressure that that works, but you live, you know." Bill Carey says it all the time. You do you, you know, and you, you got to do the job the way you want to do it. And it's hard sometimes to hold your coworkers, your, your equals to that same standard. You can encourage them. You can try to get them come along, you know, do those, but that's more likely to work than, and, you know, then, then, you know, getting jacked up about it. And then you end up in an argument over something that you don't really have the authority to, to push that issue forward. No, no, and, it's, and it ends up being wasted energy and damaged relationships, yep. uh, and la- and loss of influence. No, it's it's beautiful, yep. man. A lot of wisdom in it, man. A lot of wisdom in it. All right, another question coming at you here, Chief. This comes from Jeff Stone. He said, "Would you say that the need for transparency, transparency, and investment in explaining expectations and concepts is more necessary in the newer generations of firefighters and company officers?" Because of the lack of experience and wisdom that comes with time on the line, what has changed since you first started writing the front seat, the right front seat? And there's a lot in that uh, yeah. question there, but so, whatever you want to try and start unpacking. So I don't know that the need has ever changed. I, uh, the need has changed for transparency. I think what has changed is, um, well, all right, so maybe the need has, but earlier generations, you were you just did what you're told and you and you went out you know there was no quit because you said so you know and that worked and that was acceptable it's work my boss told me to do this i may think it's done but my boss told me to do it i'm gonna do it i think that um as we you know, generationally as we've changed there's been more of a need for some act some quantification some qualification and i think that it probably would have done, it would have been just as effective back then. It just wasn't the way leaders were taught to lead. So leaders weren't necessarily taught 40, 50, you know, and probably before that years ago that they needed to explain. Yeah, you know, I always remember like for MASH, I'm a MASH buff, like Colonel Blake one time is talking to Hawkeye and Hawkeye goes, why did you say so? And he goes, because when they promote you to Colonel, they remove the bone in your head that makes you explain yourself to captains. And 
you know, I think that that was more the mindset, you know, of that era, right? You know, I'm the boss, you do what I tell you to do, period, end of story. And now there's some, you know, going back to the why, seek first to understand all those things, there's some value in getting the buy-in and that buy-in comes from transparency, people understanding what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. And, Beautiful answer. you know, the change from when I first, so my career is, you know, relatively speaking is short. Um, I started in Harwich in 93. Uh, I started initially dispatching, um, became a firefighter in 2000, Lieutenant 08, Captain in 12 and Deputy in 15. So my right front seat time was, was kind of short toward the tail end of my career. And I went kind of quickly into the car, um, which is a hundred percent different for us, you know, so, you know, chief and deputy work days and then live at home. Um, I, I, I chuckled the first fire that I went, that my deputy went to after become being a captain, because I'm, you know, you're driving, you listen to the radio, you get there, you're trying to get dressed, you're doing all these things. You're exhausted by the time you get out of the car, let alone everything else. And, and that's a huge change from being in the right front seat. You're dressed, you know, you're, you're getting off the truck, you're ready to go to work. Um, so I think, but the, I don't, I don't think there's been a huge change in the fire service in that window for me. Right. But certainly the, you know, my job has changed a lot. You know, Lieutenant to captain was a little bit different. Captain to deputy was night and day different. No, I can only imagine. Cause I, I yeah, I'm absolutely jumping from the engine to the buggy for me was, was like, I've always told people one of the hardest uh, transitions I've ever tried to make. And, uh, Cause I didn't feel like a firefighter anymore. Cause I was no longer crawling in on the knob, but, um, right. it was and, you, kind of and a- you have to stop running. Right. I mean, that's the thing that's, that's Leo Stapleton advice, but it's, you know, it's, it's the one thing. And, and I remember reading, um, we talked about a chief from New York city, one of our tactics books. And he talked about, he used to put his gloves, in the sleeves of his coat. So when he'd get out of the car and he'd be getting dressed, when he put his coat on his hands with his gloves and it would force him to just take a breath. That was like his mental cue to yeah. to slow down, you know, because you need to, you need to stop running. You need to not use your hands anymore and use your eyes, your ears, you know, you're, you're, you're in a different role. No, it's beautiful. I was trying to think of a, uh, you made me think of something here and I'm just going to bring it up real quick because it's a, uh, and it's, it's your ship. Is it Abershoff? I believe it's Abershoff who wrote the, his, his new book, leadership communication, man, I'm getting the name of the book wrong. It's a beautiful book, but it talks about, uh, authoritarian uh community uh, leadership style that whole do it because i said so it's just a throwback to the industrial age and it's kind we've kind of just evolved past it because back in the day you sat in your office and you just made the whole point was production so production and it was workers and there was a fine line between the workers and 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 it's a beautiful uh, i've never really looked at it in that regard of the fact that we've it's not that that was and i'm trying to i won't I won't remember because it was a long time ago when I read my company officer book, but they talked about, um, you know, was it, was it the, the type X leaders and yeah, the, theory, you know, the, theory X, theory Y. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. that whole thing, you know, and, and, but it's true. Right. And, you know, and, and I've worked, you know, I've worked for those guys that, you know, most of them are retired by, or, but were bosses and retired by the time I, you know, started coming up. But, you know, you work for those where it was like, why are we doing this? Cause like freaking said, so it was pretty right. much, you know, or just do this. We don't care. You know, I think the fire service has always been a little bit different because, you, you know, there's always been more opportunity to explain what's going on. You know, we, you know, we live together, we work together. So it's not as, you know, you're not on an assembly line making widgets with the boss sitting there, you know, with a clipboard counting the number of widgets you made. But no, and there was a time when that was effective. And in those scenarios, it's effective. But the fire service has always relied on uh, right. and, and not only relied on um, succeeded because of elder statesmen of the fire service investing in the younger generation, those few and uh, not because not everyone did it, but those few that did guarantee that the succession right. continued, you know, and so right. yep. beautiful. All right. Uh, where are we going? I want to get to this. This is accountability and responsibility. And I'm not even sure how to ask the question, but there is um, especially with social media, there's so many opportunities for people to express opinions and, um, yeah. So let's- all right. So let's so let's unpack it. So I'm going to start with accountability. I, to me, and and the kind of responsibility, accountability go together. And you know, you and I talked about this briefly. So 
internal and external accountability. So I'm going to leave the internal alone. We know the accountability inside. We have an obligation to our, to our people to provide them safe work and environment, you know, to, for us to be at our best, you know, and that accountability starts with yourself, making sure that you're doing all the right stuff. We all know that. But what about to the, our external database, our external, not database, uh, customer base, right? And I, I hate using those words. The citizens. I, at the end of the day, I'm the with people, you, though. The citizens. Right, the yeah, people, absolutely. Right? Them. So, them. Yes. So, you know, you, you, you recently, recently there was, a, and I'm not going to go into any details. Some people will figure it out from the discussion. Um, and I'm going to try and keep it vague because I, I the last thing I want to do is um, malign anybody's character, slander anybody, and everything else. But there was a discussion recently about fires, vacant buildings, and the risk associated with them. And there were some statements made on that that kind of flew in the face in my um, in my upraising, you know, uh, growing up in the fire service, what we're all about. And, you know, the, a town near us, and, and, I, and this, I use this antidote yesterday, so if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, what the job's about, right, life, property, um, if you're not doing that, then you need to tell your community you're not doing it and explain to them why. And this kind of goes back to the, the transparency thing we just talked about. The fire service has gotten a free ride in my mind for a long time of where the fire department, we do what we do and nobody questions us. Most people, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but most people don't have an idea whether we do a good job or a bad job. No, they we just can, know we do a good, we just show up. Generally and, speaking, we can burn it to a slab and then give each other high fives and said, we fought the dragon. Yep. And, yeah. and most people will, still bring you a plate of chocolate chip cookies for doing that. Thank you for and, saving my slab. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, um, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go on seven different tangents here. And Do it. Have to That's, hey, in, I love but, it. That's what the scrap's all about. Go. But so if you look at some recent history and I, and I don't want to get into details because to me, it's way, way too early to judge. But if you look at Uvalde and some of the initial thing out of there, um, and some of the criticism that come out of there, I believe strongly there is going to come a day for the fire service. And it probably already has. Polk County was was uh, was a case not that long ago where the fire service isn't going to get a free pass anymore. We're going to show up and we're going to perform, and we may do the best that we can do. We may do it 100% right, but we're going to get called on the carpet for not doing something that somebody felt, feels we should do. And... So, you know, life safety and property conservation are, you know, those are our two main tenets. And, I, you know, we put fires out to put the fire out so that people's things are safe. I think, you know, Aaron Fields talks about things matter, stuff matters. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when you think about your accountability to your to your taxpayers, to your citizens, you know, you ask for that new that new fire truck for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Everybody's got. PPE that's supposed to protect them when they go into the building for thousands of dollars a set. You're wearing an eight thousand dollar air pack. You have you know a six thousand dollar radio. You have fifteen thousand dollars worth of hose on a fire truck. You have all of these things that are supposed to enable you to do your job. And then if you show up and say that's too risky, I'm not going to do it. At some point, somebody's going to push back. Right. And we're in a society right now that questions just about everything, no matter what what is done. No, and and and, and, and like everybody carries an HD camera in their everybody. back pocket, you know. Yep. So, I think that there's some accountability, and I think that there's some some statements get made on social media, and I think that anybody that thinks that the citizens don't read that, you know, I, you know, my my pool of friends on Facebook is people that I live and work with people that uh, live in my town and then a bunch of firefighters from across the world. And I get in discussions with you guys all the time. I'm always cautious about what I say because I right. know that every once in a while, somebody who's not related to my fire world will like a comment or, or, you know, reply to a comment that is on a discussion that, that I would never expect them to appear in, you know? So, right. so I think that that's a concern, but I also think that we as a fire service, need to be honest about what we're going to do. Now, if you can't do something and I get it and every world is different. Um, I just wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, an article about perspective and 
and, and it was it was based on you know everybody gets in these fights on the internet which is just stupid anyway but i can't <laughs> but because they're arguing from their perspective right they're arguing from their experience so my experience and your experience is different you work in a different world than i work in you, you have slabs i have basements um i stick out in the middle of the ocean you know you're in the middle of the country you know but our experience is different you've been to more fires different fires whatever the the case may be so when people start arguing this what they're not taking into account is it's like looking through two different pairs of glasses at the same situation and i think that that's where we get lost and that i'll go back to my seek first to understand the first thing we should be doing and i used that quote in that article is trying to understand where the other person's coming from what their experience is because there's a lot of things that dictate whether we're going to go in the building the type of building you know, the building construction, the amount of fire that's in there, the capabilities and experience of the responders that, that are there. Those things are all factors that, so for me to say that department should have done this, they may not be able to do that because there may only be two people showing up on, a, on, on an engine or two engines showing up with two people. I have a friend that's, that's out in, in Oregon in the, in, in the Bend area that, you know, routinely is, is one of two guys on the fire ground. He's the chief. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's and, a little bit different. And they're making, and, and they're right. still making interior attacks when they have to, you know, and that's, you know, to other people would lose their, you know, they lose their mind. But the concerning thing about the discussion that I was referencing was that um, there was a judgment made about, people in the building and whether or not we should go in for a certain type of person or class right. of person. And keep me honest here, Corey, because no, like, sure. I don't want to go too far into it, but I feel like whenever we make those judgments, this is my problem I had with survivability profiling, you know, the, the tenant of it, of, you know, if we're standing on the front lawn and the smoke looks so bad that nobody's going to survive, so we should, you know, we should slow down and, and, and put the fire, you know, worry about putting the fire out instead of searching. When we start making godlike judgments from the front line, I think we've gone the wrong direction Over as, as a fire service. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You know, and so. We, and like you said, when we start saying, you know, I, that. Like you said, making judgments on whether someone's worth saving right? or not. Is yeah. And that and. and there was, there was a, a line of duty death, uh, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago, Bill Carey and I were talking about it. And I was trying to remember where it was. I think it was Chicago. It was a, a vacant uh, laundromat, I think, in an alley. Um, it was early in the morning, and it collapsed, and I believe two firefighters were killed. And a, a popular fire service writer, and I don't remember who it was. I don't remember what magazine it was. It wasn't like at um, Fire Engineering or Firehouse. It was one of the popular but not necessarily right. um not one of the, the the staples but one not of one of the commonplace magazines that everybody would read but but there was an editorial that talked about um you know they the the argument was they went in because there were homeless people in the building and the statement from the author was something along the lines of you know well homeless people flee like rats you know when the building catches on fire so they shouldn't have been in there and that person got crucified on the internet and print and everywhere for making that comparison to the homeless people, the rats. And, you know, I, I just think that, you know, something we always need to be careful of to me, you know, a life is a life period and story. And we should be doing, I think the equation boils down to, in my mind, a little bit simpler, which is if there's spaces that we can get in and search, or there's, there's an ability for us to enter the building, then we should be entering the building. So nobody's ever argued in this. You know, I always love this argument. Well, you know, we shouldn't be rushing into fully involved buildings. No, yeah, you're right. I think everybody agrees with that. And that's not what anybody's saying. Right. You know, if we can get in, we should be going in. The fire started somehow, even if the house right. is vacant. And what, you know, part of our risk analysis or our judgment analysis doesn't come into is this quality of the life we are saving come into the equation? Never. Right. hundred percent. Right. Don't 100%. Agree, I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. No, that never even that's not even anywhere in my thought process. It's, it's either a life or it's not, you know, and, and to me, you know, you go back to, well, it's, you know, the building's not vacant. 
until we prove it's vacant and everything else. And all those things are dependent on what your capabilities are and what you can do. I would agree. You know, we determine that the building's vacant when we search it. We can't always search every part of the building because of a variety of reasons. So, you know, you do the best you can do, but your mindset from the beginning needs to be. And this, this is this is where I think fire training has gone askew. The conference is not certainly not, but I think that some of the basic conference uh, basic training has gone askew. Is that um, you know we're teaching from the position of fear, right? Right. Bill's Bill's done a great job with the statistics and and how flawed that they they can be, but. If all you ever hear is, well, if you do this, you could die. If you do this, you could die. If you do this, you could die. You know, how comfortable are you going to be doing your job? Because I would argue that while there's risk in going in a burning building, that risk is far less for somebody who's wearing full protective equipment and SCBA has a hose line with them and is trained than it is for the occupant that's laying on the floor waiting to be rescued. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so we, I mean, our job involves risk, absolutely. But realistically, and there's there's wild cards in everything we do, the average house fire, if there's such a thing as an average house fire, that risk, if we're properly trained and equipped, should be pretty minimal for minimal. us if if we go in and do the job the right way. And that's what we should be focused on. A thousand percent, man. Best way to take care, know how to do your job, man, is the best way to stay safe. Right. 1,000%. I am going to scroll back up here to something that Smoothbore Cartel said because I loved it, if I can find it. Dave has written some of the best responses, and this ties in here, some of the best responses to keyboard warriors that I have ever read. And he's spot on. And I wanted to touch on a couple things here, and I hope I don't lose my train of thought. One of them is what we're talking about. And I don't really like the word because it's such a soft and, and, and I don't know, but it's grace. When you say... Um, uh, look at it from their point of view, basically. It's give some grace for their perspective. Right. You know, and I don't really like the word grace because it seems so not, but it but it applies. But what I'm getting at on your responses and what Smoothbore Cartel is talking about is how do you keep that civil discourse in on the internet where it's so easy to get emotionally fired up behind your keyboard and also hold people accountable despite who they might be or where they, where they work or their tenured uh, careers or, or legendary status. And what's uh, this may be too big of a, a, a Pandora's I, box to try and even peek inside. So, but so I can try, I can try and, and, and uh, answer that at least from my perspective. And this is only my perspective. So I think I would like to think that I'm pretty well grounded about who I am and what my experience is. I am in a small new England town. Um, we don't go to a lot of fires, but we, you know, we have a pretty good run card and we go to, you know, more fire. I, we're, we're more fortunate than some in terms of, of work and, and less fortunate than others in terms of work. That's what it is. But, but that's always kept me grounded. I, I was raised, I feel like I was raised the right way in how to do the job by the, you know, the department. I started as a call firefighter in the town next door by those guys. And, and then, you know, the duck, department I'm in now and have always believed about how you know do the job the right way but I'm also pretty honest about who I am and you know I'm not going to argue with a New York City guy about um fire duty because he's going to have me beat you know nine times out of ten going to have me beat 100 percent of the time but that doesn't mean my opinion's any less so I've always but I've always tried to I've always tried to start with I take my ego and put it aside my ego I try to keep my ego in check quite a bit, which is kind of egotistical to say. So it's kind of, that was a whole hypocritical sentence, but you know, you keep your ego in check and step away from your ego and you can have a good conversation with somebody. You may not agree with them. And there are a lot of people, but I always try not to get dirty in the internet. You know, I learned a long time ago, um, Steve Gallagher is a friend of mine. He was a uh, retired as I think the assistant chief in chill coffee. Um, and he said, there's nothing anybody can say in the internet that's ever going to get me mad. And, and not because what they say doesn't make them mad, but because it's the internet. So I grew up that you don't say things at the kitchen table if you're afraid of getting punched in the face. And that's how I've always treated the internet. Same way, right? I'm not going to say something on the internet that, you know, the next fire conference I go to, I'm standing next to the guy shoulder to shoulder 
and have them go, hey, remember that time we had that conversation? And next thing I know, I'm eating tea. So right. that's, you know, that's not going to happen. So that's that's just kind of how I've always kept myself honest. And, you know, it, it, I think you can make your point without being a dick, you know, to, to put it bluntly. You don't no, need to be. Beautiful. You know, you don't no. have to be, right? No, and if you and if, and the and the people that feel like they have to be, I think it just kind of shows that the lack of their, uh, not integrity, the lack of the veracity of their argument, so to speak. So I, I read a, a a pretty cool quote yesterday, and I I actually shared it, and I loved it. It's like, uh, it said something about you know you got to be able to make your argument without yelling. So going back to my whole like I live on my emotions, so that's where I am. Like I escalate. You question me. And, you know, boom, I'm next thing, you know, my voice is up two octaves and I'm yelling across the room and I don't need to be. And, and that's kind of how I, the internet is, right? Is that you can escalate or you can have that conversation and, and maybe you'll learn something or at least learn where the person's coming from. You may not agree with it, but um, I think you're always better for it. You know, you always, you always learn something. I love it. I love it. Okay. Before I switch to the next topic, uh, yeah. Billy Rhodes asked a question, Chief, what fire tactic has changed for the best from the beginning of your career to present day? I would I actually, say I actually like uh, this question. I'm anxious to hear your answer. So, the, you know, so I came in, PPV came in when I started and it's kind of gone by the wayside. I mean, it still gets used, but not the way, you know, we were where we were, you know, putting hundreds of cubic feet of thousands of cubic feet air a fan in, in every door. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But um, I think the one that's changed for the best, I would say, and this is personal experience based on what happened in my department, is um, hose line, hose line and nozzle choice and use, you know, all around. We went from when I started, we were thirty degree fog, indirect attack, crawl to the middle of the room, hit the ceiling three times, it would darken it down, go put the fire out, and that's you know we're now we're we're in we're using now smooth bores, direct attack. Even when we're not using smooth bores, at least not in my department, but other departments are using straight stream right. on the fog nozzles. I think that that we got fire attack right for the most part across the country now. And there's there's been a lot of people that have pushed that from Andy Fredericks right on through Aaron Fields and and beyond. Um, and it was kind of so we talk about the buy in thing, right? We talked about this as a little story anecdotally going off the side. So. Aaron Fields was coming to, to our local fire academy. They got it. They brought him down here and I didn't sign up. I wanted to sign up, but I didn't sign up because I wanted to see what my guys were going to do. I was deputy at the time, eight people from my place signed up and, uh, and went. So I went and sat in the lecture part, um, both days. I didn't do the hands-on part, but I sat in the lecture. I, I watched a bunch of the, the hands-on and, and they, you know, the guys got excited. It was cool. You know, there was buying, they got excited. Aaron's, I mean, you're dead yeah. if you can't get motivated by, He's motivated dynamic, by that man. man. I mean, He's there's something dynamic. wrong with you. <laughs> but um, so guys are fired up. And we, from that, we changed. We I had gotten a grant. We got all smoothbore nozzles. Um, the I put together that eight people became part of a committee. And all our hose loads changed. We pulled more hose um, in the first six months after uh, those guys went to nozzle forward than I did in my entire career. Prior to that, you know, we stretched lines of fires prior to that was pretty much how it was maybe every once in a while in the parking lot or whatever. Most of the time, that's when you stretch lines because everybody knows how to do that. You know, that right, kind right. Of mindset. Why, would we, why would we practice yeah, it? Why do we yeah. have to do that? We know how to do it. So, so I'd say fire attack is in, in my career is the thing that's changed and changed for the better. We're way more dialed in, you know, the, the UL studies um, without going into some of the, some of that, because I have some very strong opinions about that, but we'll be here for an hour and a half just <laughs> about that. Um, but the UL studies, I think, have come around and shown really what, what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. And, you know, there's some really smart people and capable people that are involved in that. And I think that's, that's why we're, we're where we are now. Beautiful, man. Uh, I wanted to touch on, because me and you both, uh, I'm at 25 years. You have more, you're a little longer in the tooth than I am. But we're both getting to the point where we're we're, we're staring down the barrel of, of, of hanging it up at some point. And 
what's your plan or how what 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 should people's plan be to stay relevant plugged in if they want to if they don't want to just go toes up in the beach you know uh, so, how do you stay relevant so this you're you, this is this is a good topic for me so i don't have a plan i don't know what um what after work looks like right now um and that i'm not going to say that i haven't thought about it and i have thought about it you know what my wife and i've talked about it um i know that i'm not going to retire to sit on my couch because sure. i'll lose my mind <laughs> um you know i would like to i would like to teach and keep teaching but i don't know how practical that is in you know i, I like teaching the travel becomes an issue it's just you know i mean a couple times a year is fun. I don't know that I want to do it. You know, like some of these guys that are out and I don't, God bless them. I, I don't, they don't begrudge them, but I don't know that I want to be in a different hotel every night, you know, teaching every other week in a, in a different state. Um, so I'm not really sure what the after, but I think, I think you need to think about it and, and start coming up with that plan sooner than later, because I I've, I've met a lot of guys that have gotten to, you know, it also depends on where you work. So there's places where you work, where you go in, you work, you're, you're shift, and then you're done and you go home. And that's fine. My place, we rely so heavily on um, on our off-duty guys to come back and cover the station and staff the stations that, you know, it's it's it, it can be a 24-7 type lifestyle. Sure. The problem is it's 24-7 lifestyle and, and, and you get faced with the reality reality of what do I do when I no longer do that? Who am I when I no longer do that? No, and then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be a hundred percent honest. I'm human. Yeah. Who am I? If I'm no longer the fire chief, no longer a firefighter, you know, who am I? What am I doing? And I have friends that, that I've taught with that are like the day I retire is the day I stop teaching because I'm no longer relevant. I don't know that I agree with that. Um, I think that a lot of our teaching is timeless and can stay. If you stay engaged, can stay consistent, you know, for years to come. But, but I also understand that philosophy of, I don't want to be that guy hanging on, um, you know, just, just to get the free meal and the beers, you know, at, at the conference and, and not bringing any value to the game. Sure. No. Is it just deliberate intentionality of staying up to speed then? Yeah, I think so. I think okay. that, you know, I think that, well, I think that if you're good at, if, if you're good at what you teach and you, you have a solid basis, you know, solid foundation, as long as you're keeping current and making sure that, you know, you're not teaching something 30 years ago that was yeah. relevant that isn't anymore. You know, I think that you don't, I don't need, I don't think you need to reinvent the wheel every six months. I think you just need to to stay current and make sure that, you know, what some things like forcible entry will change a little bit as locks change or whatever. But at the end of the day, the basics are basic and they're going to be the same no matter where you work. And, no matter, you know, from, you know, 30 years going forward, you know, it, it should still be the same. And I think right. that that's when we argue about, or when we talk about, you know, trying to do it differently, we take time away from just teach, learning people how to do it. Right. Right. You know, especially the basics, especially yeah. the basics. The yeah. The basics are always going to be basic, you know, and no, hundred percent. All right. Where are we going here? Uh, mm -hmm. Writing, writing. I want to talk to you about writing. Cause uh, we talked about it a little bit last night, but I wanted to bring it up because uh, it had a huge impact on me. So where's the writing? And is there more coming? What's the story, brother? So every day there's a thousand words rattling around in my head that um, I used to be. At, so like I told you, so my most of my articles came out of and I, I'm a, a horrible writer. I'm a one pass haul ass. Um, <laughs> I love that kind of kind of uh writer so i i would i would have a conversation with with somebody like you or whatever or a little bit of debate or an internet discussion would spark it and i would get fired up about it and i would um i would write i'd sit down i'd write it you know in a half an hour i'd write a thousand words 800 words and i'd send it to bill carey and go check it for typos and and put it up and he would and you know a lot of good stuff came out of that um as I got a little bit more, I don't want to say experience is the right word, but as I wrote a little bit more, um, I started doing, I would start editing them a little bit and changing them around. And 
it would take me a couple of days. But what I find now is if I don't finish it when I started, then I won't finish it. I have, I have a million half written half articles. Written, yeah. Paragraphs I have, at a time. I have, I have notes on my phone where I'll be driving down the road and, and pull over and write a hundred things in the phone. So I don't know if it's because my job changed and I started right. writing, you know, more for work stuff that I had to write emails, memos, everything like that, that, um, that took my ability to write away. I don't know if it's, you know, to Kyle's point, um, my responses on the internet, a lot of times are articles. If you read them, they're just short articles. So, but I don't know if, if I, if there's an, if there's a discussion on the internet that fired me up, if I, you got your if I write, if I write 150 words to somebody in response to it, it takes it it takes that fire away to write a thousand words about it and put it on the internet, you know. So, um, I'm hope, I hope, and I say this frequently that I I can get back into writing because I think I still have a voice and um, and something to say, but I'm struggling mightily to do it. And, well, it sounds and like that's... you got a, like hundreds of notes on the phone and and yeah. half written articles. It sounds like you got a ton of voice. Yeah, I just so, gotta I gotta put it together, and that's where I struggle right now is putting it together. All right, um, I'll stay on you. I'll stay on you if nothing else. Yeah, I got you know I like I got a bunch of these you know these little books. Right. So I started I started um, a while ago. I get up every morning. I don't know why I I'm up at like four thirty five o'clock. Sit in the couch, quiet time, drink a cup of coffee. So I started like to use deliberate instead of watching videos of them building tables on on uh, Facebook. I decided to I would journal every morning for. Um, five minutes, just whatever came to my mind, I would just write until five minutes was up and I would stop. That's awesome. I pulled a couple articles out of that. So there, there were some, um, that had some value to it, just kind of undisciplined when it comes down to it. So, you know, uh, I just gotta, I just gotta stop making excuses and do it. Um, I love the five minutes of journaling every morning, man. Are you still doing that, or is it is it, no, is it one I, of no, those? I stopped. Yeah. I stopped no, no. I try to do the same thing. I try to have yeah. uh, five minutes of meditation. I try to do an hour of reading a day, which I can break up throughout the day. Yeah. Uh, you know, ten minutes here, five minutes there, and I try to track it. But uh, yeah. not the point. When I when I'm consistent, uh, man, it's so productive. And yeah. then of course, me being human and me being me, I am wildly inconsistent at times. I'm really good at being inconsistent. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Brian Brush said, "My buddy, all caps, miss you, buddy." So I had to I had to throw you at that, Brushy. Brian. It's the best, one of the best humans I know, right there. Yeah, you're not alone, my friend. Uh, Smoothbore Cartel said, "Bottom line, Chief LeBlanc needs a chauffeur at work so we can mine more gold from him." <laughs> uh, some guys would die to get the stuff in their heads out in an article like you do. That came from Fire Culture. Um, William Van Brimmer asked, was your writing pre-shift or the following morning as you were getting off or both? Uh, I very rarely wrote while I was working. Um, I would say a lot of times it was because what there was one captain and he and I would always have good discussions. He was my captain for a while. And then when I got promoted, he, we, he relieved me or I relieved him. Um, and he was usually the guy that would be, the foundation for a lot of my articles, we would, we would get into a discussion and he would bring up some points and, and, and I would counterpoint him. And then that would be, and then I would go home, sit down and write an article. And it wasn't, it was never by intent. That wasn't my intent. It wasn't my intent to have the conversation and then write the article. Right. It was, I would, I would have that discussion and then I would chew on it while I was driving home, you know, a thousand more words going on. And then I would go home and pull out my laptop and just vomit an article out send it to Bill Carey and be like, Hey, make sure I didn't spell your name wrong and, and put it on the internet for me. And you know, <laughs> Beautiful, man. Bill, Bill was awesome. I mean, he, he really was. He, he, uh, he, I trusted him implicitly with, I'm like, whatever editorial changes you need to make, you make, you know, because I know he's never going to steer me. And he very rarely did. He, um, I, I don't think he ever did. I mean, he, he would fix spelling, and, and that was about it. And, you know, he always, he gave me that voice and, and that ability and, and the Constantly. confidence to do it. So. And, and the impact it's had, uh, Jack McGovern, uh, wanted to know in an era where it seems like departments can only personnel for five, 
what are your, I'm assuming five years, but uh, what are your suggestions for retaining people in your department? How do you keep people to retirement? Any, any <laughs> hints, tips, life hacks, what you got? Uh, so we, we, and I, I only want to say this out loud because um, I feel like I'll jinx it, but we're blessed that this department has a really good core group of people. It always has people come here and they don't leave. I don't know what the secret sauce is. I know that we keep feeding it and it keeps, you know, it keeps consistent. Um, I, I, I credit the people that came before long before me and I have, I've had nothing to do with that. I'm a caretaker of it. That's all I am. Um, I'm watering the grass and making sure that the lights are on. And, uh, but, um, we definitely have, have, have had that. And, even with around us, we're places people that, you know, moving around and everything else. And I, you know, I feel like some of that's going to change uh, financially. There's some places that, that pay a lot better that, that aren't that far away that I could see in the future um, are struggling, but we haven't struggled because people want to work where we are. We don't have any secrets for that. Um, we've, we've always had chiefs that have been, that have been pretty tolerant of the troops in terms of, of letting have say in what needs to be done and and listening to them um, when that comes and and I think that that matters I think that, that people you know you you know just because you're the chief doesn't mean you have to you know no, some of these are my ideas very rarely is it should it be my ideas like the 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 troops are the ones that are doing the job so they should have the input. Um, and I'm not always good. I'm listen. I everything that I say here. I you know I always I always in the back of my head. I'm going. You know, if everybody, <laughs> if all the guys at the firehouse are watching, they probably be like that guy's full of crap. Right. You never. But um, I you know I, I have strong opinions about a lot of things, and it, but I try and listen um, more than I speak, and 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 let them have input where they have input. And I've made decisions and had them push back and been like, no, yeah, you're 100 right. I don't even even when I don't agree with it, but. What if they, if you can make a compelling argument, then, um, so I think that, you know, ha letting people have a voice in it, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a fireman wearing a chief shirt. That's all I am. And, 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 and I'm, 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 I don't mean that in a negative way. I love it. And I love going to, I love going to fires. I love doing the job. And, um, I put up with all the rest of it, uh, to be able to do that. And, you know, my, my troops love going to fires and, and love doing the job and, that's that's what we want you know that's what we want to do 100%. and 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 that's none of that's like you know uh, understanding a p you know i like it like if the motoring public are watching this you know i get it i know i'm talking to you and you understand what i'm saying but you know nobody wants to see somebody um somebody suffer a tragedy somebody's house catch fire nobody wants to see that but all of us want to be able to be in a position to make an impact when that happens 100%. and and make the best impact we possibly can no, and, and I want to touch on a couple, two things. First of all, uh, I think it was Jack McGovern that asked the question. Um, just to spring, well, I want to touch on what you said first. You're just a firefighter wearing a chief shirt, man. If if more chiefs had that mentality, then I promise you retention would not be the issue that it is today in America's fire service. Uh, the other thing is, and someone mentioned it in the comments, but Jack, find the book, The Functional Fire Company, written by the uh, Chief Scott Thompson. And read, if you don't read the whole book, if you're not a reader for whatever reason, but read the whole book, first of all. Chapter 2, uh, The Chosen Culture, 100% uh, a life hack. I hate saying that. I've said that like three times and I don't know why. <laughs> it is a hack for uh, uh, retention in the fire service. Man, understand. That fire first culture is why firefighters join the fire service. And if, if people can wrap their heads that and lock into that it will make a difference in your firefighter staying all right um jim platt another question coming at you because i like this question chief do you think doing a daily journal for your shift is important and i don't know i don't know if he means shift duties journal or just doing a journal in general but he wants to know do you think it's important why or why not so i wish i had done uh from the beginning of my career uh, yes uh, i wish i had done a, a you know, a diary, a, a journal or whatever you want to call it. Um, 
you know, I, you look at all these, you know, all these guys that, that, that write these great stories. I have a million great stories and I can remember them on any given day, depending on how hard I hit my head. Um, but I wish I had written them all down and some of them are funny. I mean, just, just, you know, we'll do that. You get around the table and you talk about a guy that retired and all of a sudden like the stories will just start flying. And I'm like, man, I wish I had written all these down when they happen. So from a personal level, I think that that is important. I am a wicked traditional guy. Yes. I love. And, and, but we don't do this where I work, but I will tell you, I'm a traditional guy. So I had a friend uh, worked in New Haven that wrote the, the, the company book, you know, for his, for his company that he was on when they worked, you know, they had a, they had a log book and they wrote everything down, you know, and I love that. I think that that's a cool, we have the bunch of the old log books um, in our department that are still there. I love going back, looking through them. Um, the company journals that the, you know, I used to, I used to, when I used to collect a bunch of fire memorabilia, I used to get old ones out of New York city and everything else. And things were this big and the guys wrote really flowery writing that you couldn't read, but it was just, you know, it, it just, it's, it's your history. And I think your history is so important. You know, we, we own our first fire truck, our fire association bought it and, and redid the whole thing. Nice. And you know, it's, it's not super old. It's 20, it's 1927. So it's, you know, we're coming up on a hundred years here. Um, but it's nice to be able to, you know, for the guys in those pictures, that captain I told you about that, I, that I used to relieve and, and was I, my captain, he went through and pulled all of our pic old pictures out of the photo albums and framed them and put them up on the walls in the second floor. So you walk down the halls and all these old pictures are there. And, and I love, cause I know a lot of the stories behind him. Cause I picked the brains of the guys that came before me taking, you know, the younger guys and they'll look at a picture and it'll spark their interest. And then you tell them the story that goes with it. And, and hopefully that gets carried on. I think that that's huge. So I would love, I would love to do company. I won't do that. Cause my, I'm sure, pretty sure I get shot if I suggested <laughs> it, but I would love, I'd love to do company journals. I think they're great. I wish I had done a personal journal from the beginning of my career, man. I wish I, I'm the same boat, man. I'm a journal guy. I'm I'm huge into journals and I try to, I have like, I could probably pull up out of my, my, uh, bookcase back there, like three or four that have like 20 or 30 random entries in them. And I'll start another one. But, uh, again, my consistency, but I will tell you this is that I, I've told my son when he got on the job, I said, Hey, just, just get a diary type book that you can buy at any bookstore. I don't care if it's, and, and just write in it every day, because I promise you 20 years from now, you will not regret it. I can, I can introduce you to a hundred people who have 30 plus years in this job who said, I wish I would have kept a journal yep. and I can introduce you to thousands of young people on the job. who are like, ah, I'm not going to do that. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, it's, it's true. Yeah. hundred. I wish everyone, I mean, I'm preaching to myself here in the mirror cause I right. still could do it every day. So yep. oh, speaking of books, and it's my favorite part, but what we're going to do is this is where I show my absolute and unbelievable trust in chief LeBlanc. Cause I'm going to give him the, the microphone for a minute. I'm going to run out of the room. You got like one minute to talk about whatever you want as I grab a drink and hit the head before we go into books. Oh so, boy. Anyway, well, I'm going to talk right about, back. I'm going to talk about books while you're gone. <laughs> nice. So he, uh, this is a kind of an awkward thing talking without the host. Um, but I think that I think that going back, if I'm just going to go circle back on that culture thing just one more time and finish up, you know, is I think that making things um, making things special within the department is something. So that our department started uh, probably about 2005 or six, somewhere around there. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe a little earlier. It started doing like change of command ceremonies, and and since then we've done uh, change of command swearing ins. Um, all of those things, we do those on a, a pretty regular basis. And it's an opportunity for us to celebrate the personnel and, um, and also an opportunity to sh let the public share, you know, share inside the firehouse. And I think that that's another thing we cut, kind of touched on it earlier with the public is you, you need the public on your side. You need to take every opportunity to let the public figure out what the fire department's about. Um, I'm sure everybody can relate to conversations they've had with people from the public that think that there's you know hundreds of guys working every day or 
you know, I, I, I've had conversations with people like, how big is the apartment? You're like 36. They're like, oh, all on at one time. You're like, no, no, there's like eight on at one time. So I think that um, sharing, sharing your department with the public and, and obviously depending on the, depending on the uh, size of your department, everything else that's easier or harder to do. But I think that we, we need to not be a close, not be such a closed society and open our doors and let people in. It's talking about Corey, we, probably about 04, 05, something like that, we started doing change of command ceremonies. And then we did, we do promotional ceremonies and we do swearing ins and everything else. And we make a big, you know, big deal out of it. We, we celebrate the guys that are getting recognized um, for their accomplishment. And that's really important. And I think it's one of the things that, I know it's one of the things that we, we get a lot of compliments on for doing well. And I think that any opportunity you get to share your department with the public is is invaluable you just can't overstate the 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 advantage of doing that nice i don't know what you talk about but i came in for the tail end and now i get yeah. to hear it on the back end when i listen to the recording yeah so i'll get to hear it so beautiful thank you for running that for me sure, no uh, problem. i'd love to know and of course me and you talk about books quite a bit every time we talk so it's always yeah. interesting but i like to share books with the audience 100 percent books that you think firefighters should be reading so i'm reading the book right now and i'm struggling through it because it's a lot to read but um it's it's uh I, and i actually pulled up my books nice um there are people already saying wait a minute. i got it so i gotta give because i'm gonna get crap for this so this guy see this i don't know if this will show up see this handsome guy right here i got it. little little bright there you go little bright. Yeah, yeah okay kind of so that right there oh there, there you go. go now you can see him so that is one Mr. John Spanbauer. Okay. So if anybody doesn't know John Spanbauer, he's part of the 350 line guys, Richmond guy. Um, he firmly believes that pineapple does not belong on pizza. And, and it's his mission in life to make sure that nobody has pineapple on their pizza. So I'm just sharing that because he said I wouldn't. So I'm just sharing that so everybody knows that John Spanbauer says no pineapple on your pizza. All right. Fair. Sorry. Sorry, okay. I, I digress. Now I got to find. So uh, I am reading now. It's called Grit by Angela Duckworth. Nice. And you and I talked about this a little bit last night. So this is an amazing, there's a lot in this book. And it's it's a little bit of, it kind of goes in like. Is this the one uh, you're struggling through? Yeah. Okay. Because it's okay. a lot. It's just long. It's no, not, no, no. I'm struggling through because no. it's long. I'm I'm old. I like short things. I like I'm like an instant gratification guy. You know what okay, I'm saying? Okay, okay, making sure because okay. Yeah, but um, so, but she, she talks about you know like people that persevere that are that are good because they they knuckle down and, and keep trying. You know, and um, Simon Sinek does when he talks about the seals. You know, and he talks about you know the perfect seal isn't the guy that's you know big and muscly or you know, super fit athlete or anything. It's the perfect guy is a guy that can go completely to the point of exhaustion and then give a little bit more. Keep going. Um, so grit talks about all that, but it talks about um, why people are good. It talks about, and then the, the thing you and I were talking about last night, she gets into this, this whole thing of deliberate practice and, you know, you can practice for thousands of hours a year at something and be good or you can have deliberate practice where you practice for maybe a little bit less time, but in a much more focused with goal oriented. And they talk about it with swimmers. So like you're going to swim a hundred, hundred meters in a minute, 14, and then tomorrow you're going to swim it in a minute, 13 or whatever. Yeah. I don't know what the times are. I'm not a swimmer, but, but that's what she talks about, you know, like setting a goal for that particular training session and then trying to beat it and then worry about the next thing. So um, it's a good book. Um, I actually read, uh, I'm going through my list here. I, I got a, I got a bunch on here that I haven't quite. So there's actually a cool duty was actually good. Uh, it, it was a, it not, it was a, a Bill Gates or Robert Gates there who was, um, sec def, yes. uh, for two presidents, both Republican and that there's a lot of good stuff in that. Um, okay. sailing okay. true North. Okay. It was a good one. Start of us, uh, Admiral uh, Start of us was that's that was a great one. Sailing but, true north. Sailing true north. Yep. Okay. Um, but Annie Duke, 
who was actually a professional poker player, wrote, uh, she wrote two books. The one I have, oh, there, so one's called Thinking in Bets. And the one that I've read most of is called How to Decide. And it's all about like decision making and everything else. And so, really, okay. I love yeah, those. They're both, so, you know, you and you and I talked about this, Carly. So, you know, um, I'm a, I'm a fan. If somebody, if you don't have this book somewhere in your, on, in your, yeah, uh, combat. Yeah, it's 100%. on combat, somewhere in your, in your thing, you need to get it. I'm a huge fan of like the whole mindset, mental preparation, mind thing and how the mind works and, and how we react to certain things and everything else. And all those books kind of tangently go off on, you know, how the mind works. And yeah, I, I think my biggest thing with reading that I learned was you have to be able to, to interpret things into what we do because some of the best books about firefighting are not about right. firefighting. No, with that, on combat specifically, right. man, it's one of the best books ever to apply to us. Oh, go ahead. No, no, that's why. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. So, um, yeah, on combat, but you know, you're not. It's not talking about firefighting, but you can absolutely pull. You know, and, and so we talk about like the risk thing, right? Let's go back to the risk thing. You know, kind of keep circling back on topics. You know, he talks about police officer, the time when they decide that they're going to kill somebody if they have to kill somebody with their weapon, their service weapon, isn't when they're standing on the front lawn at 2:30 in the morning with a gun pointed at somebody. That's not the time that they need to decide that they need to have thought about what they're going to do before that. And, you know, the same thing is for you. If the thing you, you know, you need to decide if you're going to push down that hallway or be able to push down that hallway or, you know, make that search or BS that window, or whatever, long before you ever do it. And if you're not willing to, if you haven't had that conversation with yourself, yes. then you're going to fail when the moment comes. I love that, man. I love it. Uh, any other books before I cut you off? I don't want to cut no, you off. No, I think I think those are a couple. No, nothing, nothing are shaking there. But have that's... you read Peak? I'm I'm right in the middle of Peak. I'm listening to it on Audible. Actually, I I liked it so much on Audible, I ordered it. And, really? Uh, no, I okay. haven't read that. But it's um, understanding. I, I'm getting it wrong. Understanding the science of expertise, which goes into deliberate practice. It's it's completely focused on how to develop uh, deliberate practice anyway, cause you oh, really? on nice. grid, So, and it's, and it's an easy read. So that's another part that's and good the, about it. You know, the, another one that's good. And I think it's Malcolm Gadwell. I'm not sure. I got to find it now. Um, outliers. Yes. That, I don't know if you read that one. So I, I read oh, tipping I, point. Tipping point is one of my favorites. I haven't read outliers. Eh, look at this buddy peak. It's right here. I got the sample of it on my, uh, on my nice. thing. I haven't, I haven't read it. I downloaded the sample, but no, yeah, it, outliers is good. Um, he references outliers quite a bit in that, uh, in oh, really? NP. Yeah. yeah. So cool. it's, of course my list, I, I think I just added 61 and 62, uh, to my list of books to read and I'm trying, and even that's what the hour a day and I'm pretty religious on the hour. A day. I got a stopwatch on my phone that I, that I, that I use to keep Good track of the hour a day and I still can't catch up. Now, are you one of those people? Do you read multiple books at a time? Yes. Yes. Yeah, see, I can't, I, I, I can't do that. And I can do it a little bit. Like I have a book, I will usually have a book on my desk at work that I'll try and read for like 15 minutes when, when the time will happen. And then I usually read at night um, sure before I go to bed. But So, and part of it is because like Sources of Power, Klein, man, it's a great book. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. it, it's, it's dense, man. I have to take breaks from it because right. uh, it's, it, like I said, it's dense. Oh, here's Peak. I have, this is the copy. I barely started reading it because mainly I'm listening to it on Audible. So you can see where my tabs are on it. But, uh, and then I've got like, uh, uh, what's his name? Obstacles, Holiday. Obstacle, Ego is the Enemy, Obstacles yeah. the Way. Ego, yeah, I have but Ego is ones... the Enemy actually downloaded now. Um, the Obstacles the Way was, uh, that one is awesome. That, I haven't that got to it yet. Book. I started with Ego. But those yeah. ones fire me up, so I kind of use those for inspiration. And then I get into the denser material. It's more like uh, reading the topic for the topic itself. And then I also love to read for pleasure and, and fiction. I love fiction, so. Nice. Anyway. Uh, yeah, we could nerd out for hours on books here. Everybody else is like, whatever. Okay. Right, exactly. We have a thing on the weekly scrap. You've been through it before. It was the five questions for firefighters. Okay. After hundreds of guests and many people answering and all the low-hanging fruit being taken, we had to update it and say the next five questions for firefighters. So, Chief, David LeBlanc, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? Yeah. Do I, is there a failing grade? The uh, answers are 100% your opinions. There is no right, right or wrong. Perfect. And the points are arbitrary. They're assigned by me. 
And there's been, <laughs> qu- there's been quite a bit of debate of whether I just give everybody max points. It's not true. Some people do not get it. So, but bottom line is this. What single characteristic, number one question, single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier go-to badass firefighter? Passion. Don't even have to think about it. Passion, 100%. Um, I, I think that qualify that a little bit, you know, ability, yep. skill and ability, skills and ability are always, you know, obviously you want, but um, a passionate human in anything, I think in anything is, is going to move mountains and be where you want them to be. And you don't necessarily have to be the best, but if you're passionate, you're going to be really damn close to the best. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, um, yeah, to me, that's, that's, that's what you, that's what you want. You I want somebody that, that, you know, that, that loves the job, loves the work and, and is passionate about it. And, you know, it, especially in a job that, that can be, can be draining a lot of times, and, right. you know, so that would be my one word, baby. Passion. I like, I like the answer. I like the trait. Uh, and it's hard to argue with because this job is a hell of a lot more fun when you're good at it and when mm. you're passionate about it. And I love, I love that passion. Number one, uh, max points on number one. Number two, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? Learn about people. Mm. It took me far too long. And I'll retire before I get even close to being where I want to have any kind of competency in it to figure out people. Um, you know, you, you work with people is one thing, but understanding the nuances of relationships and conversations and being able to have difficult conversations without um, being pissed off about it and um, without being afraid of doing it. Um, You know, everybody, everybody dislikes uncomfortable conversations. Absolutely. Some people are better at it than others, but everybody dislikes them. But there are people that have them every day and you're, you know, I, I, I'm in awe that they can do it because it's, I feel like I, you know, I struggle with it every single day. Ben Martin. Um, and I talk about this all the time and he'd put me, put me on a book a long time ago. I'll give you one more book conflict con the conflict competent leader. When I was having some trouble trying to work my way through some stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I would say learn about people, all the rest of it comes, but, um, people, you know, both in, Externally and internally, going back to that reference, we deal with it. It's, this job is 100% about people, 100% about people and um, being able to figure them out and how to work with them and, and how to deal with them and, and be better. I, it makes you a better human. And I think that's what we should all strive for. Beautiful answer. First of all, just uh, learn about people, especially if you could tell it to your like 20 year old self. How, 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 yeah. how much of an impact would that make? But not right. the point. You added n- book number 62 to my list of what I have to read. And then have you, have you read uh, Green, Robert Green, uh, Laws of Human Nature? No. Man, it's, a, it's, it's massive, okay? But right. it's, it's written really well. I'm telling you, Scott Thompson's the one who turned me on to it. Right. And it is, it is probably my favorite book for learning about people. Now, don't confuse it with The 48 Laws of Power, which is also Robert Green. Not near as good a book. Okay. Laws of Human Nature. Unbelievable. Okay. Uh, because I had to nerd out on books when you said that. Love that. Max points on number two. Number three, what is your favorite training drill? Hey, so I don't know. I mean, it's, so this is one I'll struggle with because drilling was something as a company officer I struggled with. Um, and, I, you know, we, we, we talk about it all the time. I mean, I loved teaching and training, and I'd probably be better at it now than I was then because I was doing as much teaching. But just because you love it doesn't necessarily mean you're good at it. Um, so coming up with like drill ideas and then putting together a good drill was always a struggle. But I, I you know, I think like uh, I would have to argue like that might like a first five minute drill where you, you know, your single company drill and you pull up and you know, what are you going to do in the first five minutes? So it's getting water, getting, you know, pulling a line, getting water. Maybe, you know, you're doing a search, nice. you know, that, that type of thing. I think putting it all together, right. We do, we drill in the individual things all the time throw a ladder and do a search. We dress the hydrant and, you know, run the deck gun. We, uh, we pull a line and flow some water, putting all those together in real time and, and doing, I think that's, 
probably would probably be my favorite drill. I think it's probably the most productive drill. All right. I love the answer. I, anytime you, you involve a company, multi-company, and you're actually pulling lines and doing stuff, you get max points from me, period. So 100%, especially if you get people radio traffic and making decisions. Right, that's the, right. Uh, to me, that's the perfect drill. So you're right, right in my favorite wheelhouse. Uh, call back here. William Brambrenner wanted to know, quick question, back to number one. What, if I may, can you teach passion, or is it just something you have or don't? What is your opinion? I, 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 <laughs> I'm not – I'm not the expert on that. I don't think so. I don't think you can teach passion. I think that you can create interest that may cultivate passion, but I don't think you can teach passion. I think that, you know, we should be striving to keep people engaged in, in doing the job and you don't engage people in doing the job by cleaning the bathrooms, something we have to do. But I think if every day you come to work and all you do is check the trucks, clean the bathrooms, and check the trucks and clean the bathrooms and go on calls, you know, okay, yeah, I'm I'm a I'm I'm a, I'm an ambulance attendant that that cleans the bathrooms, you know. So I think if you can create interest and keep people interested and focused, that that maybe cultivates passion. Right on, right on, right back to that fire first culture. No. I love it, man. Uh, and you're right. Get, create conditions where passion can bloom, but you can't just teach people it. Yeah. Right. I love it. Okay. I don't know where I was at, but you got max points on your training drill. Number four, what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Uh, so I'm going to go back to uh, my losing my temper. I, so going back to, so it goes back. You're going to see, and this is my perspective is probably different now because of my role, but but losing my temper. So um, like we talked about uh, people and all those things. So I lost a guy uh, was on my shift because I completely came unglued. I, he did something that made me so upset. Um, I was on the phone with him. Uh, I was at home. I was on the phone with him. It was actually a tent company installing tent, a tent in the backyard for my brother-in-law's family reunion. It was in my house. And I was yelling so loud on the phone that my wife had to go outside and tell the tent guys that I was on the phone with somebody. So they didn't call the cops thinking that I was yelling at her. Nice. And he ended up hanging up on me and completely and forever damaged our relationship. Not that it was great to begin with, right. but, um, but I learned a valuable lesson that day, which is just because you can lose your temper doesn't mean you should lose your temper and you lose going back to right. Yelling, raising your voice, elevating. There are times when you need to be authoritative and firm. And, but when you yell, you've lost control. And when you lose control, you, you create, you damage relationships beyond repair. My experience, that's my experience. No, it's fucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, a thousand percent love, not only the personal story, but the answer. And so, you are four for four on max points. And technically, William Van Brenner said max points twice because you had a question in there where you answered it can't be taught and also max points. So final question, number five. It's not a new question. It is the age-old question. Yeah. Heavy fire, searchable yeah. space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? I so I don't know. So I'm trying to I was trying to remember my answer from the last time. I, I did not go back and check. So you know and I now. think I think my answer this time would be I I want to be on the search. I wanna I wanna be in making a difference. And not that I mean it's a hard call because oh, 100%. you know it's it's like the age old argument people used to have with like you know smooth bore or fog nozzle. I'm like, I want the one that's got fire in front of it. I don't care which nozzle it is. So <laughs> that's where I want to be. But um I think I would I would argue now that in my in where I am now, that the that the the VES would be where I where I'd want to be. I love it, man. You just went six for six on the five questions for firefighters. Nice max points. One hundred. You do math. You do math like I do math. Yeah, hundred <laughs> uh, percent. All the time, hundred percent of the time, it works every time. Right there, it is officially one hundred and forty three scraps in the books. Chief Dave LeBlanc. Nice. Hey, if someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do so? Ask them questions or follow up or just pick your brain the way I do. So, I mean, the the, the best way is, uh, well, two ways. I'll give you my, I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm not a secret. My 
my logo is it's a red coffee dave's coffee sign um feel free to add me i get a million friends and i and facebook doesn't let me talk to half of them but i mean and that's i made some of the best connections there the other is my email address so my first initial d period leblanc l-e-b-l-a-n-c at comcast.net shoot me an email um i check it pretty religiously so um but yeah i'm happy to talk you know about anything and if i you know, I learn everything that I do. It's why I teach. Everything that I do, I learn from. So uh, I'll I'll take as much from you as you give me every time. Now I have to ask: Have I been mispronouncing your name the entire time I've known you by saying LeBlanc? No, you. Well, you technically pronounce it the right way. I pronounce it the wrong way. Okay, so. okay, I feel bad. But so yeah, it's I don't know. We we went through this with the family. LeBlanc is is the right way. Um, it's been Americanized, and we call it LeBlanc. And I, what do you prefer? I don't care. Okay. I'll say, I'll say a little blank. I'll say, yeah, no, you're good. Whatever you want, man. <laughs> Just don't call me late for supper. I don't care what you call me. 100%. There it is, man. 143. <laughs> Brother, amazing. Uh, everybody, audience, thank you for the questions, comments, uh, everything. I got a few housekeeping things always. Uh, go get shirts, coin stickers, hats. Here's the deal. I, this is no surprise to anybody. Cost of everything is going up. Cost on the store is going to go up in the next couple of weeks as we make our next set of orders. We're going to adjust costs. Costs are not going up right now, so if you want to get something at the current rates, go purchase uh, Firehouse Vigilance swag. Um, the loading hats, I think there's like, we just got them in and they're almost sold out because you can't keep the loading hats in stock. So if you want one, grab one. Um, we are going to start advertising on the scrap, so I, I announced that to everybody. But here's the deal. There's been a few people out there in the fire sphere that have been supporting the scrap and monetarily supporting the scrap with uh, subscriptions and donations. So me personally, as the host, I wanted to say, how can I bring value to those people? And so what I'm going to do, and I, and I don't want to ever take the scrap away. I never want to put the scrap behind a paywall or anything like that. It's never going to happen. Um, so what I want to do is this, is if you are someone who supports the scrap, I'm going to do a live broadcast once a month that only the subscribers and the, uh, the supporters get to go into what's going to be in there, man, it's going to be me and my thoughts and talking about books and talking about classes and talking about the future of the scrap and what the next five questions are going to be and who should be on as guests and things like that. So if you want to be involved in that and support the scrap, that's what I'm going to try and add for those people who support it. So I hope that makes sense. I will be sending out a uh, invite to everybody that is a subscriber and anybody that supports the scrap. So I'll be sending that out. So I wanted to announce that other than that coming up as guests, we've got, Don Sap, man, Uncle Don's coming on. We're going to talk. It's going to be a good time. We have Firefighter Fenton. If you're a fan of big mustaches, he might be the only person who has a better one than uh, Dave LeBlanc here. No, he's got me. He's got he's that got big, old, by a ton. big old mustache. It's going to be fun. That, that one is going to be a fun one. Uh, followed by Robbie Owens, Kevin Pfluger, Todd Shepard, which, you know, I, I have to talk to Todd because he just got hit by a tornado. Uh, up there where he's at and see how he's doing and see if that's still going to happen. And then here's the deal. Episode one, number 150, as a tradition, uh, episode 100 was Kurt Isaacson. So episode 150 is also going to be Kurt Isaacson. He is going to give away a whole bunch of passes. I think the number is five passes to the upcoming conferences. I didn't get the details on which ones, but I'm on that, on that scrap, we were going to give away five passes to CF Tactics conferences down there in Pensacola and get people going to it. So tune in for that. Other than that, uh, that's all the housekeeping. Unbelievably good time. Uh, Chief, thank you so much for your evening. Thank you, Corley. Thank you, brother. I'm honored honored to be on, and uh, it was a great time as always. Everybody, audio, oh, Smoothboard, thank you. Great question. Smoothboard Cartel, Kyle, my man, taking care of business. He said, how do we subscribe? If you go to firehousevigilance.com, there's a big giant button that says, do you want to support the scrap? And there's multiple ways you can do it right then and there. Uh, there is no tiers. There's no differences. It's whatever you feel like the scrap is worth to you. And uh, and then we're going to do the vigilantes. And it, I really am, uh, not to take away from anything, I really am excited about this because it's going to be a uh, uh, just a private thing with the most uh, – intimate uh scrap uh, it's not a scrap because those will always be out here free with the guests so anyway there's that answer so uh back to where i was at thank you dave thank Thanks you both. audience unbelievably good questions i hope the tone stays silent unless it is burning everybody stay safe out there